All right, let's go ahead and start with our first uh, PowerPoint. And what it is, is Vayara. And what does that mean? And he appeared. Imagine that. How'd you like to have the Lord all of a sudden appear to you? Oh, oh and just a reminder, this last Wednesday was the very anniversary of Noah's flood. Okay, here we're going to start at Genesis 17, uh, verse 15 through 18. And let's look at what God said to Abraham. He said, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai anymore, but Sarah shall her name be. I think it's interesting. If you remember the Tetragrammaton, or God's name is the Yud, hey, Vav, hey. He gave one of his hey's to Sarah and the other hey to Abraham. Okay. And this is why they were able to produce life. Now, all of us want to be blessed by our parents, but how would you like to be blessed directly by God himself? That's going to be a good one. And he says, I will bless her and give you a son of her. Yea, I will bless her. Boy, a double confirmation here. And she'll be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall come from her. And what does Abraham do? He fell on his face and he just started laughing. And I think this is interesting. It says, he said where? In his, it wasn't verbal. He said in his heart, oh, will a child be born to him that's 100 years old? And will Sarah that is 90 years old bear? Now, of course, God didn't get on his case like he did Sarah's case. But um, Abraham said to God, oh, God, let Ishmael might live before you. And God said, Sarah, your wife, is the one that's going to bear a son indeed. And you shall call his name what? Abraham. And Sarah did not name him. God named him. And he named him a year in advance. Only a God can do that. And so Abraham said to uh, God, and then God said, he, she will bear a son. And then he says, I will establish my covenant with Isaac for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. So we see in Genesis 17, 21, 22, a second time, he says, my covenant will I establish with Isaac that Sarah's going to bear at this set time in the next year. And he left off talking with him and God went up from Abraham. Now, when he says the set time, what is it referring to? I can't hear a, a divine appointment. It's a Moed. So which divine appointment was he referring to? Passover. Isaac literally was born on Passover. Isaac was born on Passover. And so in Genesis 18, now verse 1 and 2, look at this. And the Lord appeared to him. Now the Lord there is the yud Hey vav Hey, And that's very important. That's who appeared. Now what's amazing to me is in most Orthodox Jewish circles, they say God has never uh, appeared as a human. Well, here, I, I don't see how they can get out of that. Uh, but it says he appeared in the plains of Mamre. Uh, do you guys remember where that is? Hebron. That's Hebron. So that's where he is. And it says he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. And one of the things is he had just gotten circumcised. They say this is about the third day of his circumcision. And he's sitting there in the heat of the day. And he lifts up his eyes and he looks. And what did he see? Three men standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them them from the tent door and bowed himself to the earth. Now, it's very fascinating uh, about the rest of this story. How many of you know if I said you, do I mean you singular or you plural? We never know in the English unless we read the context, but even then, we don't know if you is singular or you is plural. But in Hebrew, there is definite implications of who you is. And I was talking to uh, Dr. Danny Bengigi about all of this, and it's really exciting when you understand what was really going on. Because how many of you know English is not the best? Look at this. In Genesis 18, 
3 and 9, uh, Abraham said, my Lord, is what every English one says, and that's wrong. It's my Lord's. It's plural. Lord, you have to know when is plural and when is singular, and the English has it all wrong. It's supposed to, when he says my Lord's, he's speaking to all three. He's not speaking to just one of them. And uh, the word is Adonai. And then he says, if now I have found favor in your sight, and the word you're there is in the plural again. So in most Christians, when they read it, okay, they look at Lord and they think he's speaking just to the yud hey vav hey, And uh, he says, I want to have, uh, do a favor in your sight. We think that's singular. No, he's speaking to all three when he says in your sight. And then he says, please don't go away from your servant. And again, that is plural. Okay, and he says, let a little water be fetched and wash your feet. That's all three of their feet. Again, if, if, we're not, if when we say Lord, we think it's just referring to one of them, but it's all three. And he said, I will get a morsel of bread so all of you can refresh your heart. After that, you may go your way now that you have come to your servant. And look at, what does it say? They said, can you imagine all three speaking at once? All three of them are speaking at once. Very well do as you have said. So what did Abraham do? He hurried into the tent to Sarah. And he said, quickly prepare three measures of fine meal, knead it, make cakes. And then what did Abraham do? He ran to the herd and he fetched a tender and good calf and gave it to the servant. Then he hurried to dress it. And then he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. Oh my goodness, what does that have to do about kosher having milk and meat whoops they don't the jews don't really like that one either they they say that well they serve the milk three hours later you know yeah what's going to happen to milk in the heat of the day after three hours okay but the interesting thing is here you have three people speaking as one well isn't that fascinating now let me show you this uh, here is uh, in Danny's uh, book, I'll show you. But he has the meaning in English, uh, the phonetic, and then in the Hebrew. And you can see whenever you have the word Adonai, it's always plural. So every time we read Adonai, we have to realize that is plural. It's not singular ever. And then there's the different pronunciations depending if it's your Lord masculine or your Lord's uh, feminine, you know, then his Lord's, her Lord's, our Lord's, your Lord's, you know, masculine plural, feminine plural. But all of those are different ways of uh, saying Adonai depending on who's talking. But you, what you have to know is Adonai is never singular. Talking about the triunity of God. Uh, most people don't even catch that. But uh, it's in that book that we have here on the supernatural uh, life of Hebrew. That chart is a lot bigger, it's expanded, uh, that I just showed you a little cutout of. And we have it available here, or you can go to Hebrew1.com and get it. But I just wanted you to know that that is so important to realize that Adonai is always in the plural. And then look at Genesis 18.10. He says, I will certainly return unto you when the season comes around. And lo, Sarah, your wife will have a son. And Sarah heard that in the tent, which was behind him. Therefore, what did Sarah do? She laughed. And she said, after I'm old, will I have pleasure? My Lord being old also. And the yud hey vav hey said, there wasn't Adonai here. It's yud hey vav hey said unto Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of surety bear a child? And I'm so old. Who but God knew she laughed? She laughed within herself. Only a God could do that. And then in Genesis 18, 14, and 15. And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of surety bear a child who am old? Is anything too hard for the yud and then look what he says again. At the set time, I will return to you when the season comes around and Sir will have a son. What is the set time? Passover. This is when this happened. 
And then Genesis 21, 6, it says, and Sarah said, God has made me to laugh. So everyone who here will laugh with me. Well, get a load of this. Both Abraham and Sarah entered their laughing place. They, I could just see them just cracking up laughing about all of this. You know, uh, does God laugh? I mean, sometimes people don't realize that God laughs. Where do you think we got our laughing from? I think he has big belly laughs. Look at uh, Psalm 2, 2 through 4. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against Israel, saying, let us break their bands asunder, cast away their cords from us. And it says, he that is sitting in the heavens shall laugh and the Lord is going to have them in derision. I can just see, you know, hear the, all of the Islamic people are coming against Israel and God is going to sit in the heavens and He's going to have them in derision shortly. Look, a matter of fact, look at Psalm 37, 12, and 13. The wicked plot against the just, gnashes upon him with his teeth, and the Lord shall laugh at him, for he sees his day's coming. Look at Job 5, 22 and 23. At destruction and famine shall you laugh. Neither shall you be afraid of the beasts of the earth, for you will be in league with the stones of the field, and the beasts of the field will be at peace with you. Wow, that's powerful. And so it says here in Genesis 18, 20, 22, and the Lord uh, aid because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great. And because their sin is very grievous, uh, I'm going to go down now and see whether they've done all together according to the cry of it, which has come to me. And if not, I will know. Now think about this. We're reading about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. What time of year did that happen? Passover. Now we're understanding, if you understand these things, that the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah happened at Passover. That's an appointed time. And uh, it's the yud Vave who said, I will go down and see what's happening, and then I will know. So who's going to go down? It says the Lord, uh, yud Vave, the Lord. Okay, <clears throat> but then it says... And the men turned their faces from there, and they went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the yud vav So who went down? Is there a yud vav that went down and a yud vav There's uh, how many yud vav Are there, you know, this is kind of interesting. Now, here, Abraham is talking to the yud vav and he says in verse 32 and 33, Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak but once more. Suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. He's working his way down. I'm skipping verses, as you know. But do you know uh, how many Jews they want to have uh, in uh, service? At least 10. Because of this. It's called a minion. The whole idea that Jews need at least 10 people is because of this verse where 10 were required. Uh, who knows if uh, God might have gone lower. But that's where Abraham stopped. So they believe they have to have at least 10 men for a minion. Okay, so Abraham, when you look at it, he's trying to bargain with God. He becomes the first Jewish lawyer. <laughs> this is why all the Jews get this from Abraham, this ability. Now, the Torah portion begins with Abraham's hospitality of how he's taking care of all of these strangers. And now we see, what is he even doing? His intervening on behalf of a group who are, who are not his family, not his people, not his ethnicity, not even his religion. And yet, here he was concerned for their fate. Wow. He is interceding for a bunch of wicked people. How many of us would intercede for a bunch of wicked people? It's no God get them. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And so what do we see happens? In Genesis 19, 1, only two of the angels come to Sodom in the evening. And angels could be messengers because here they were called men before. Now they're angels. So they're still men, but they're messengers, not literally angels. Could be the yud heh vav -Hey. And it says they came to Sodom in the evening. When you think about Passover. This could be right before. This could have been like Nisan 14 going into the Feast of Unleavened Bread at evening is when it starts. 
And it says Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. What does it mean to sit in the gate? He has authority. He's one of the judges. That's what it means to be sitting in the gate. And then it says, when Lot saw them, he got up to meet them and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Well, what's interesting, Abraham at first thought they were men. It says, I saw three men. And then later he realizes they're more than just messengers. And Lot sees them, uh, you know, he saw them and he, you know, thought they were just messengers as well. But you know what's interesting about Lot's name in Hebrew? The very first letter of Lot's name is what? What would you think? The Lamed. And what does the Lamed represent? Authority. Authority. Shepherd's staff. Okay. The next letter in Lot's name is the Vav. And the Vav is what? It's the word and. It's a conjunction. So it's authority that is connected to, and the T is Tet, which is the serpent. He'd given his authority over to the serpent. Much of the churches today have done the same thing. Okay, so look at this, Genesis 19, 2. And he said, behold now my, what? Lords, but what the Hebrew word is there is Adonai again. So here they translate Adonai as Lord at the beginning, and now they translate it correctly as Lords. And so this is why when you uh, know Hebrew, you can catch this. And he says, turn and I pray you into your servant's house, tarry all night, wash your feet, rise up early and go on your way. And they said, no, no, we're just going to sleep out here in the street. Now, look at this, Genesis 19.3. He insisted strongly. They turned to him and entered his house. Then he made a feast and he baked what? Shazam. Look at that. It's the feast of unleavened bread. Okay, and they ate. Now, here's the thing. Lot wanted to be hospitable, but he also wanted to get them the heck out of there because he knew what the place was like. And then look at the next verse. Before they could even lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house around, look at this, both the old and the young, all the people from every quarter come banging on the door. And this shows you their cruelty to strangers. Now, what was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah when we think about it? You know, all kinds of things, but what is the root of it? Well, look at Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49 and 50. Behold, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. And what's the very first thing? Pride. Fullness of bread. Abundance of idleness. Look at the internet today. People are full of pride, their abundance of idol. They get on the internet and then they get in all kinds of trouble. And then it says that she didn't strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. No, they were haughty and they committed abomination before me. That's why I took them away as I saw good. Wow. And then look at verse 14 and 15. What does Lot do? He goes out to speak to his what? Sons-in-law who had married his daughters. And he said, get up, get out of this place for the Lord's going to destroy the city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. Can you imagine, you know, if someone goes into a movie theater, it goes fire. If everyone believes it, they panic. But if someone goes in and goes, ha, 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 there's a fire in here. Ha, ha, ha. No one's going to believe him. This means Lot didn't believe that they were actually going to be destroyed. He wanted to obey what the two messengers said. And he goes out, hey, the Lord's going to destroy the city, you know, with fire. And they thought he was joking. This speaks to us that we have to be serious when we warn people about the judgments that are coming. We all know judgment is coming. But if we come across like we're unsure or we're joking, people aren't going to heed what we have to say. 
<clears throat> and then it says, when the morning dawned, the angels hurried, urged Lot to hurry up. Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. Okay, how many were in Lot's family? Eight. Eight were in Lot's family. You got Lot and his wife, the two daughters that are with him, and then the other two daughters with their two husbands, son-in-laws. So there's eight. And so when Abraham's bargaining with God, he's thinking, okay, the eight over here are probably righteous. I just got to find two more. Surely there's two more. And that's how he came up with his 10. Okay. In Genesis 19, 24... Let's see. Let me show you this real quick. Before I go on, if you remember, what, was, what does Isaac's name mean? Laughter. That's what it means. And here is uh, the three-letter root word, Sakak. And how old was Abraham? 100. And the kuf is 100. And the tzade is 90. That's how old Sarah was. So here, his very name of laughter speaks of a 100-year-old and a 90-year-old coming together. I always thought that was fascinating. Okay, so now let's go here. Um, I thought this was interesting. Genesis 19, 24. Then the yud he vav he rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the yud he vav he out of heaven. Wait a minute. There's a yud heh vav heh on earth and at the time, and there's a yud heh vav heh in heaven? Look at that. It says, then the yud heh vav heh rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the yud heh vav heh out of heaven. Wow. And then verse 26, look at this. Lot's wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Now, here's my question. We know she became a pillar of salt because she looked back. My question is, why did she look back? Well, think about this. Who went with her? Her two single daughters and Lot. Who did not come with her? Her other two daughters and their husbands. Why is she looking back? She was wondering if they were coming. But more than that, someone said it's because she wanted to die along with her other two daughters. Some say it's also said that it was measure for measure. And listen to this. Lot's wife was like the rest of Sodom in being cruel to strangers. And when these uninvited guests came into her house to spend the night, she was really mad. And so they say that she resented it and intentionally went to all her neighbors asking for salt to feed these extra intruders as there was a law not to allow travelers into one's home. Therefore, measure for measure, because she went asking for salt to let them know she had guests, she became a pillar of salt. Fascinating. Okay, we go to Genesis 21, 14. Now we see Abraham rose up early in the morning and he took bread and a bottle of water and gave it to who? Okay, Hagar and Ishmael was making fun of Isaac. And so Hagar and Ishmael, Sarah said, get him out of here. Now, what does Hagar mean? The letter he, ha, is what? The, and ger is stranger. Her name was the stranger. That's what Hagar means, the stranger. Now, look at this. Abraham gives, him, gives her a loaf of bread, a bottle of water, and put it on her shoulder, and the child had sent her away, and she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Well, now, wait a minute. Let's think about this. What was Abraham's financial condition at the time? Well, go back clear to Genesis 13, 1 and 2. Abraham went out of Egypt, he and his wife and all they had, and lot with him into the south. And Abraham was very rich in cattle, in silver, in gold. We know he had 318 trained servants as well. Okay. Look at Genesis 14, 14. When Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318 to pursue them. So why in the world 
didn't he give Hagar some silver and gold? Why in the world didn't he also give her some livestock? You know, why didn't he loan her some of his trained servants for protection? Isn't that fascinating? Why, why the, a loaf of bread and a bottle of water? And you have all of these camels and gold and silver and protection and when she's in the wilderness. It's one thing to send her on her way with a bunch of stuff, but he sent her away with nothing. Okay. Well, there are two answers that I've read. One of them is Abraham wasn't worried because God had promised Hagar would be cared for under his protection. And Ishmael would become a nation. So he figured, okay, God, it's your problem. <laughs> okay. But anyway, I think this is uh, fascinating is Genesis 22. The very next thing we see is it's time to sacrifice Isaac. And God says, now take your son. I mean, when you hear, now take your son. I'm going to see that as a command. And Abraham goes, uh, yes, sir. That's not what happened. Here you go. Here's the Hebrew. You have Viomer, which means, and he said, but for some reason, they don't translate in the English. Take, we have, and he said, now, take your son. But guess what? It's please. You don't say that in the English. God says, to him, hey, would you please take your son? And what is Abraham's response when he says, your son? Was that Ishmael or Isaac? Which one? I have two sons. And God says, your only son. <laughs> well, what do you mean? You know, he goes, the one you love. And he goes, okay, Isaac. <laughs> he has to break it down for him. And I want you to go to the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you of. Wow. That is crazy. Now, so here we have Abraham taking Isaac. Now, how old is Isaac at the time? We always see him as a little boy. Isaac was 37. Well, how do we know? Because Abraham was 137. Now think of this. Abraham is 137. Isaac is 37. Don't you think Isaac could have ran away if he wanted to? So he willingly went with him. Now, he, he willingly laid on the altar. He willingly let dad bound his hands and his feet. He didn't, he just, this is why he, Isaac is a type of the Messiah. But yeah, they were 37 and 137. Now, here's what's fascinating. What happened? We know there was a ram caught in a bush, right? This is why this event happened on Rosh Hashanah, the very day of the blowing of the shofar. And it's because the ram's horn is representative of the shofar. The Akedah happened on Rosh Hashanah. So Isaac is born on Passover. 37 years later, he's got to be sacrificed on Rosh Hashanah. <clears throat> now, listen to this. Why do you think he, Abraham, was willing to sacrifice his son. Well, the pro, the God promised that the covenant was going to be through him. He's not married yet. So Abraham says, God, if, uh, if, you don't, if you're not a liar, I believe you could raise him from the dead again. So, okay, I don't think he actually wanted to kill him. I think he was going to kill him in the hopes that God would raise him from the dead. As a matter of fact, if you look at Hebrews 11, 17 through 19, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises, there it is, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall your seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from where also he received him in a figure. He saw this. I, and I think he actually saw the resurrection of the father's son being raised from the dead on Passover. I think he not only saw that Isaac would be raised from the dead, he saw that in a figure of the father is going to sacrifice his son and raise him from the dead. So we go back to Genesis twenty-two nineteen, 19. And it says, 
So Abraham returned to his young men. Well, wait a minute. Where's Isaac? And it says only Abraham returned. And they rose up and they went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelled at Beersheba. All right, well, it's kind of fascinating, and we're going to look at this more next week. But how old was Abraham? 137 when Sarah dies. So if Abraham's 137 when Sarah dies, how old would Isaac have been? 37, okay, when his mother dies. And then we see that he mourned for three years. Look at Genesis 23, verse 1 and 2. Sarah lived 127 years. This was the length of Sarah's life. Sarah died in Kiriat Arba, the same as Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And then Abraham comes to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And then we see in Genesis 25, 20, Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife. So he mourned three years. But there's a couple of things in here that I think are pretty fascinating. Why is this called Kaisera, the life of Sarah, when it's all about her death? Why not call it the death of Sarah? But no, it's called the life of Sarah. And then not only that, it says Sarah dies in what city? Hebron, Kiryat Arba, which is Hebron. But where does Abraham live? In Beersheba. So wait a minute. Was there, uh, how many of you women would leave your husband if he was going to kill your only son? <laughs> that was a miraculous birth. You're nuts. So what happens? Abraham and Isaac go up to Jerusalem to Moriah. Sarah goes, I'm out of here. <laughs> and so she goes over to Hebron. And then we find out Abraham comes back to Beersheba and Sarah's gone. And then she ends up dying in Hebron, which is why he came to mourn for her. Those last three years were not the best three years of Abraham and Sarah's life. Think of that. For three years, Abraham and Sarah at the end, and she dies without her husband there. I don't know if a lot of people ever thought about that. But we're going to look at that more next week. So let's stand. I'm ending this one about 10 minutes early because I'm going to go longer on the next one. <laughs> all right. Father, I just thank you so much for all those who are here locally right now. I had to get up a little bit earlier. Father, just bless them and all those live streaming around the world. Also, just bless those and all those around the United States. I pray, Lord. Father, that this Shabbat would be a Shabbat like no other that today... Hearing your word would not just enter our ears, but enter our hearts and would change our lives. Father, I pray our lives would be changed. And we just thank you so much for all those that are here and all those around the world that help take Torah to the nations. We thank you for uh, any uh, tithes and offerings. Father, it's all about you. It's all for you. We want to help your people in Israel as we do. And Father, we want to help the locals here so, Lord, I just thank you so much for all those who have a heart, a big heart, to give, to advance your kingdom right here and right now. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit. Through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Uh, I, I believe this is this Shabbat, uh, the second half, and next Shabbat, the second half, is going to probably be one of the two most important messages I've ever given. So I want everyone to really pay close attention. Uh, let's start with this PowerPoint. In... Uh, Exodus 1716, God says, or it's it said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And I'm going to be talking about the coming war with Amalek, which refers to Iran, as I will show. 
But this generation's war with Amalek will occur, I believe, the spring of this next year through the spring of 2025. We're prophetically going to see the Isaiah 17 war take place and the Psalm 83 war take place from the spring of 2024 through the spring of 2025. And I will uh, show you why. Now in Genesis 10, 21 and 22, we know about Shem, right? It says, unto Shem also the father of all the children of Eber. Well, actually, that translation is wrong. It's, he was the great-grandfather of all the children of Eber. And Shem was the brother of Japheth, the elder. Even to him were children born. And now it's going to tell us who the children of Shem were. The first one is who? Who was the firstborn? Alam. And Asher and Arphax said, and Arphax says was the grandpa, in case you're wondering, of Eber. So, and Lud and Aram. Now, does anyone know who came from Eber? Who descended from Eber? I'll give you a hint. Eber is where you get the word Hebrew from. That's where you get it. To cross, Eber means to cross over. Abraham was one who crossed over. And he was a descendant of Eber. Okay. Now, who came from Elam? And where did Alam settle? This is what we're going to be looking at today. But I wanted you to know Elam was Shem's firstborn. Okay? All right. Now, let's look at Exodus 16, 1 through 3. Here they took their journey. This is right after the plagues. And they cross the Red Sea, and they take their journey from Elim, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month. Does anyone know what's the first month on the Hebrew calendar? Nisan. And what's the second month? Er. Er. Now I have a calendar here of that second month of Er, and I wanted you to know that it just so happens last year, all of the events lined up perfectly. And what I mean by that is this, the 15th day of the second month or the 15th of Er, what day of the week was it? I can tell you what day of the week it was. It was a Shabbat. And it so happens, you'll notice in the top right on the sixth there, it says that it is uh, the 15th of Er. Does everyone see that underneath? How do I know that it was a Shabbat? Because of the following verses. And I will show you. Okay, it says here, after they're departing out of the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, and the children of Israel said to them, would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots, when we did eat bread to the full. You have brought us into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. I, this has only been a month. They left on Nisan 15. It's now ER 15. And what do we know about ER 15? What quarter of the moon is it? Is it a new moon, a quarter moon, a full moon? It's a full moon, exactly. You have to remember, when you read the first of any month, it's a new moon. If ever you read the 15th, it's a full moon, and God has everything based on the lunar cycle. And so this is why this happens on the full moon, and only a month later. And so look what it says in Exodus 16, 8. And Moses said, this will be when the Lord will give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning, bread to the full, the, or, because the Lord hears your murmurings, which you murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings aren't against, against us, but against who? The Lord. Right? Okay, so here we go. Let's look at the thing. It was that night, they got the quail. And he says in the following morning, you're going to get the manna. That's how we know, because they ate manna for six days. They got the double portion, and then on the next Shabbat, they went out to gather manna again. Remember the story. You can't have manna for six days without the Shabbat being in the middle of it unless it happens this way. 
So everything lined up. Now watch what happens. Exodus 17, one through three. All the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin now. After their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord, they pitched in Rephidim. And what happens? There's no water for the people to drink. Wherefore, the people again chided with Moses, give us water that we can drink. And Moses said to them, do I look like a garden hose? No. <laughs> Moses said, why are you arguing with me? Why are you tempting the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us all and our children and our cattle with thirst? Okay, so this is where the living water, I have Messiah, the living water on the rock, and the water comes out, right? Remember all this story. I just want you to see what day of the week it actually happened. Now, watch what happens next. On the picture, they're murmuring one week, they're murmuring the second week, and then comes Amalek. Murmuring always brings an Amalek experience. And it says, then came Amalek, fought in Rephidim, and Moses said to Joshua, go get some men, go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I'm going to stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did, as Moses said to him, and fought with Amalek. Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill, and it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. When he held down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So here we have them holding up his arms. So they say the battle of Amalek took two days. That's how long it lasted. And then we come to Exodus 17, 16. For he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Every generation will have a war with Amalek. It's right there. It tells us. Just like Hitler was the Amalek back then. This next year will be the war with Amalek. Now, this happened about 1300 B.C., 300 years later comes Saul. And in 1 Samuel 15, 2, and 3, it's now like 1,000 B.C., it says, thus says the Lord of hosts, I remember what Amalek did. God has a good memory. 300 years have gone by. And he said what he did to Israel, how he laid in wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all they have. Don't spare them. Slave, man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And what did Saul do? He didn't do what God said. It says in 1 Samuel 15, 32. Then Samuel said, bring here to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. So what's the name of the king of Amalek? Agag. Agag. Now, what happens 400 years later... It's now around 600 BC. We know that's when Babylon destroys Jerusalem, right? Then a hundred years later, what comes about? It's now 500 BC. So it's been 500 years since Saul spared Amalek. The Medes and the Persians conquer Babylon, right? So all the Jews that were captured in Babylon get moved over to Persia. The Jews all thought everything was safe in the diaspora because they had mostly assimilated. It's been a hundred years they've been living in Persia. But what happens? Here we have Esther 9, 24. Because Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the what? He an Agagite. He is a descendant of the king of Amalek. Agag was the king. He's an Agagite. He is a personal descendant from King Agag. He got advanced and set a seat above everyone, and all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai did not. Now, so here we see Haman the Agagite. Amalek is located in this place. Well, look at this. Nehemiah, who came later, was also in this very same city. Here we see the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, I was where? In Shushan the palace. Where is Shushan? Does anyone know where Shushan was? Well, let's 
take a look. In Daniel 8, 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, vision appeared to me, even to be Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first, I saw on a vision, and it came to pass when I saw, I was at where? Shushan the palace, which is in the province of who? Alam. And I saw on a vision, I was by the river Ulai. So where is Elam? Who is Elam? Well, let's go back. Here is our genealogy chart. We see Shem up at the top. And you see in the middle underneath the red circle is our fact set. You go all the way down, you get to Terah who beget Abraham. Okay, so that's the line there. But over here we have Elam is firstborn. And guess who Elam is? I ran. The Iranians. Now watch. Here is all the Arab countries are yellow. And what language do you think they speak in Arab countries? Arabic. But notice to the right is Iran in green. Iran are not Arabs. They're Persians and they don't speak Arabic. They speak Farsi. Okay. Now, if you go to Iran and you see about where Kuwait is, okay, just to the right of Kuwait in that area is Elam. That's where Elam is, and there's Susa, which is Shushan, where the palace was. So the palace is right here. The Medes and the Persians overtook Babylon. They moved the captains from Babylon to Shushan the palace, which is the throne of Elam. Here's the Ur of Chaldees, where Abraham left. Uh, and, you know, Babylon is right up in here, and that's where Tower of Babel was. But I want you to notice... This is Iran, represents literally Amalek. Now, look at this. Jeremiah 49, 37 through 39. Look at what God says. I will cause Alam, and who's Alam? Iran to be dismayed before their enemies and before them that seek their life and I will bring evil upon them even my fierce anger is gonna come upon Elam, says the Lord. I will send the sword after them till I have consumed them and then look at this, look right there. Boom, God says I'm gonna put my throne in Elam. Yes, God's throne is in Jerusalem, but he's going to have another throne in Elam, it says. Look at this right here. It says, I will set my throne in Elam, and I will destroy from there the king and the princess, says the Lord. But when is it supposed to happen? It will come to pass in the latter days. This, is where, this prophecy is for us today. That I will bring again the captivity of Elam, says the Lord. Now look at Jeremiah 25, 15 and 18. For thus, now this is the, the Tanakh. This is Jeremiah. For thus says the Lord God of Israel to me, take the wine cup of this fury at my hand and cause all nations to whom I send you to drink it. So here we go. We've got the wrath of God the wine in that cup is going to go to all the nations. And look at what it says. Jeremiah says, I took the cup at the Lord's hand, and I made all the nations to drink it unto whom the Lord has sent me to it. Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and the kings and the princes to make them a desolation, an astonishment, a hissing and a curse as it is this day. So Israel had to drink that cup. He said, all nations, all nations are drinking the cup of the wrath of God. Now, look at Revelation 16 and 19. And the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. This is what Jeremiah is talking about is today. What is going on? Look at Revelation 14, 9 and 10. 
And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anybody worship the beast and his image and receive the mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. He'll be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Revelation 4, 17, 4 and 5. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and decked with golden precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, which was full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head was the name written mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. We're living in the times that Jeremiah saw and that Daniel saw. This is it. Look at Jeremiah 25, 26 through 29. And all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world which are on the face of the earth, as well as the king of Shishak, will drink after them. Therefore you shall say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, drink, drink up and be drunken and vomit and fall and rise no more because of the sword which I will send among you. And it will be if they refuse to take the cup at your hand to drink it, then you will tell them, thus says the Lord of hosts, you will certainly drink of it. For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name. And you think you should be utterly unpunished? God says, look, if I'm punishing my own kids, you think you nations around the world are going to get unpunished? Oh, no. You can bet if I'm spanking my own kid, I'm going to be spanking all of you. He says, for I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, says the Lord of hosts. How many of the inhabitants of the earth? God's sword is going to be coming on all the inhabitants of the earth. Look at Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 30 through 33. Okay. Therefore prophesy against them all of these words and say unto them, the Lord is going to roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He will mightily roar upon his habitation. He will give a shout and those that tread the grapes, does that sound like revelation, the grape harvest? And against all the inhabitants of the earth, a noise will come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He's going to plead with all flesh. He's going to give them that are wicked to the sword, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, evil's going to go forth from nation to nation. A great whirlwind will be raised up from the coast of the earth. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth, even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They will be dung upon the ground. Wow. Does this sound like the end times or what? Now, let's look at Psalm 83. This is a prophetic war that has not taken place yet. I have the verses also up on the screen. It says, keep not silent, O God, hold not your peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, your enemies make a tumult. Those who hate you have lifted up the head. They've taken crafty counsel against your people. They've consulted against your hidden ones. They have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. And who is involved with this? Look at Psalm 83, 6 through 8. The tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagarenes. Who knows who the Hagarenes are? Cut it off. They come from Hagar, Gebal, and Ammon, and Amalek. There's Amalek, the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre, and Assur also joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. So who are they? I don't know if you want to write this down or take a picture. But Edom... Ammon and Moab all involve Jordan. Gebal and Tyre involve Lebanon. You know what countries are going to come against them? 
Aser is Iraq. The Philistines and Amalek are also Gaza. Amalek is in the Gaza Strip. That's where they were when, e when they left Egypt and they're coming down to the Promised Land. They uh, got attacked by the Amalek, the Amalekites first. That was the Gaza Strip, guys. This is where Amalek was. And then the Hagarenes and the Ishmaelites refer to Syria, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. This is the war that I believe is going to be taking place next year. But wait, there's more. There's also the Isaiah 17 war. And it says, here's the burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is going to be taken away from being a city and it will become a ruinous heap. So here we go. The Isaiah 17 war. Whoop, get back here. Isaiah 17 war. So here we are. That is what is coming. Now, I'm going to go here for just a second. Oh, not again? Okay. Hamas means what? Okay, Jill, I forgot to play one of the videos during the opening, and I want to play that one now. This is the one where the son of Hamas, who is going to be speaking, is giving us a little short message right now concerning Hamas. Remember, his dad was one of the founders. Go ahead, Jill. Why we cannot give Hamas what they want? Because Hamas is not only political terrorist group. Hamas is a religious terrorist group. If it was only political terrorist group, then we can put enough pressure on them where they get to the point where they com compromise, drop their violence, then participate in the political process. But Hamas, you cannot bend them because they prefer to die and not to drop their ideology. They think that they are holy warriors, that their holy and sacred mission in life is to destroy Israel, force 10 million uh, Israelis to relocate as a condition to build their Islamic uh, state. Hence, we cannot give them what they are asking for. Yahya al-Sinwar, an ex-prisoner that was released in the Gilad Shalit uh, prisoner swap a few years ago, along uh, thousand other Hamas uh, prisoners. Soon later, after his release, he became the Hamas leader in Gaza Strip. Today, he orchestrated this attack on October 7th, with one goal in his mind, not only Jewish slaughter and fear and violence uh, uh, that uh, he meant to bring to the world. He meant, most importantly, to bring back hostages so he can blackmail Israel, blackmail the international community. This guy, Sinwar, hardcore guy, you know, in fact, he beheaded somebody in prison for suspicion of collaborating with Israel uh, using the sink of the bathroom. Merciless. This is the guy who's in charge of Hamas in Gaza today, and he's under the ground, most likely under Al-Shifa hospital, taking patients of a hospital as human shields to protect himself. Qatar has been the wrong mediator in this issue because they take Hamas side and they have been fooling Israel. Okay, what country has been fooling Israel? Qatar or Qatar? Okay, well here's the thing about this military, they're the only military in the world, the only army in the world that murders its own citizens. They see the people of Gaza as the shield against their weapons. 
Here, most armies use their weapons to protect the civilians, whereas Hamas uses the civilians to protect their weapons. Not only did they kill the Jewish people on October 7th, they were killing everybody. 35 French people were murdered, 33 Thai nationalists, 31 Americans, 21 Ukrainians, 19 Russians, 12 Britons, 10 Nepalis, 10 Germans, 9 Argentinians, 6 Canadians, 5 Romanians, 4 Portuguese, 4 Chinese, 4 Filipinos, 4 Austrians, along with 3 Italians, 3 Belarusians, 3 Brazilians, 3 Peruvians, 2 South Africans, uh, and then one from Chile, Turkey, Spain, and Colombia, uh, one from Cambodia, Australia, Honduras, Azerbaijan, Ireland, and Switzerland, two Hungarians, two Mexicans, a Netherland, uh, two Paraguayans, Tanzanians, Sri Lankans. They were killing, these people are animals. Now, we are going to send $100 million in humanitarian assistance for Gaza. That would be good, but there's one problem. Think of a bank, and you have somebody who's robbing the bank, and they've taken civilians, and uh, they have hostages, and then they ask for a pizza. Who's going to get the pizza? It ain't going to be the hostages. It's going to be the, the bank robber. And the, that's what's happening right now. As a matter of fact, as Gazans scrounge for food and water, Hamas sits on a rich trove of supplies. They bring it in for the civilians, and then they put the gun at the civilians and say, see you later, we're taking it all. If you can't police, it's one thing to bring it in. It's another thing to police the distribution. Now... How many of you remember the Taliban who were ousted in 2001? Do you know they were invited back in 2021? We invited them back. All right. Well, they're already cracking down on women again and killing women if they don't have their burqa on. But I want you to notice this picture is 2022. They're proud to be back. They're glad to be back in 2022. You know why the Taliban is so glad to be back in Afghanistan? Because we left $7 billion of military equipment in Afghanistan after we withdrew. $7 billion of equipment, including planes, guns, night vision goggles. The Taliban's new U.S. made war chest. We gave the Taliban $7 billion of military equipment. And guess what just happened? This fine man here, who's in the Knesset, Ben Gavir, who's in car charge of security, because the military all have guns, but all the citizens, a lot of them don't have guns. They take guns away from the settlers so they don't cause problems. Ben Gavir decided we're going to give guns to all the civilians in the West Bank. How much do you think that cost compared to $7 billion of weapons left? Well, guess what? On Saturday, the newspaper Harvest reported that National Security Minister Itamar ben Gavir had been pictured handing out rifles to the nation's citizens and community security squads, the one that's in charge of the city located throughout the kibbutzim. The episode created a diplomatic incident which manifested a threat from Joe Biden and his abettors to end arms shipments to the country. From the article, the U.S. administration told Israel that it would not supply the country with arms if they're used to arm civilians. And if they are to be distributed at political events, the administration also threatened to halt an order of some 20,000 rifles that were purchased by the National Security Ministry from American suppliers. The U.S. announcement shocked Israel's defense establishment in light of a considerable rifle shortage, resolving the crisis involved both political and judicial officials. And you know what? All of those guns in that picture were Israeli. None of them were U.S. rifles. But they don't like the Second Amendment here in the United States or there. So here we can give $7 billion of military equipment to the Afghanis, but for heaven's sake, don't let a U.S. citizen in Israel have a rifle. Now, we know the big divide here between the left and the right 
Well, guess what? In Israel, things are getting resolved. Here, the politics, everything's being set aside. Israel's parliament approves a national unity government. Israel braces for war and tries to put their differences aside. They say life is what's most important. Let's forget what's separating us. Even the religion, what do we see? War sparks unprecedented mobilization by the ultra-Orthodox. None of them would join the military. And here we have 2,000 Haredi uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews join the military just in one month. They're all flooding in. So, so you see this obvious unity, both politically, religiously. But what's happening here? While they're coming together, we see division. Democratic divisions, even within the Democratic Party over Israel policy, heat up as Biden tries to keep his coalition together. Democrats risk long-lasting rift over Israel-Hamas war. Israel violence also underscores the GOP divide on foreign policy. In the GOP, they say we need to worry about our border and not worry about Gaza. So um, There is a big division both in uh, the left and the right. Everything's falling apart. Now here, Anthony Blinken, and he is Jewish, here he's in Congress testifying, and look at all the raised red hands. The protesters were calling for a ceasefire repeatedly, which interrupted his testimony. But I've got a video. Go ahead. There has been a lot of discussion about that $6 billion the U.S. was going to unfreeze for humanitarian materials uh, to, to Iran. And officials were asked about it today. What did they say? That's right. John Kirby uh, was asked about this today. But, you know, we heard about this in our own NBC's own reporting from Wally Adiamo. He's the uh, deputy secretary of the Treasury. He told House Democrats that they were going to actually block this six billion. And, you know, Katie, this has been a favorite right wing talking point ever since Saturday that the U.S. was now financing terror. But John Kirby addressed that directly. Here's what he said. What I can tell you is that every single dime of that money is still sitting in the Qatari bank. Not one of it, not one dime of it has been spent. And even if they had accessed it, it wouldn't go to the regime. It would go to approved vendors that we approved to go buy food, medicine, and medical equipment, agricultural products, and ship it into Iran directly to the benefit of the Iranian people. Okay. And Katie, you know, important to note amidst all this chatter about that six billion and that was released or that was, uh, you know, part of the guarantee for those hostages last month that, you know, there is no real proof that uh, Iran was really behind this attack on Saturday. Now, we know for sure that Iran backs Hamas and Hezbollah and gives them quite a bit of money. There was one report in The Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago that said that Iran helped plan and actually greenlit the operation. But the, you know, the actual really putting their fingerprints on it, really being involved in the in the minutia of the operation, that was what The Wall Street Journal was saying. But so far, Hamas itself, Hezbollah, Law, Iran itself and the United States and Israeli intelligence have all said there is no evidence of any of that. Okay, so here we have Israel, I mean Iran, getting six billion dollars, but the U.S. says it's okay. We put it in a Qatar bank, and they're holding it and not going to give it to Iran. Okay, well, let's look at something else for a minute here. Here we go. Here is Hamas breaking through the Israeli border. They had a, you know, supposedly one of the best border protections. They're breaking through. They're coming in with, uh, by air, land, and sea. And what do we see? They're attacking a bunch of women and children and men at a rave party. But the problem is this. They thought it was a time of peace. It wasn't a time of peace. It was a time of war. And if we don't know what time it is, it's going to happen to us. Now, we've opened wide our border. If we just open it, we don't even protect our border. As a matter of fact, uh, if you look at this, here's more. People from the uh, nation of India are entering the U.S. illegally. There's a flood of people from India. But wait, there's more. Here on the left are all Haitian, thousands of Haitian immigrants. And on the right, 
there are hundreds of military age Chinese men that are coming here from all over the world. The U.S. Customs and Border Protection reported that just under 2,000 Chinese nationals crossed the border in 2022. See that, 2000 and 2022? But the first few months of 2023 have already seen 4,300 more Chinese military age people coming into our border. The Biden administration saw 1.7 million migrant encounters in 2021, followed by doubling it, 2 million in 2022, more expected in 2023. According to the Wall Street Journal, 2,200 migrants from China came through a place known as the Darien Gap from January to March, compared to only 71 the previous year. There are people that says from over 100 countries that are all popping up here, and you would ask yourself, well, why are they coming here? He said many of the migrants are seeking a better life, but his trip to the Darien Gap left him with concerns about our national security because all the military aged men were coming in from China. Now, we have Alejandro Mayorkas. He's our Secretary of Homeland Security, and he said over 600,000 illegal immigrants evaded law enforcement at our southern border. 600,000 illegals came across our border. Now, here's Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates. Up there's Iran, right across from Qatar. There's Qatar. Now, U.S. and Qatar agreed not to release to Iran the $6 billion, right? Okay. Let me go here. Look at this. Official Qatari media outlets continue to unreservedly support the terror organization Hamas and to publish articles and cartoons comparing Israel to Nazi Germany and the Palestinians in Gaza to the Nazi victims. Now, SIA is an acronym for special interest aliens who are a potential threat to our national security. And they showed a record 172 individuals on our terror watch list were apprehended, 18 suspected terrorists. But this announcement came only a week after officials at the Border Patrol leaked, someone there leaked data showing over 10,000 special interest aliens, over 10,000 people who are suspected of wanting to cause terror were encountered by U.S. border agents just between October 2021 and October 2023. And the SIAs are travelers to the U.S. who already are engaging in suspicious travel patterns or other activity. The SIAs that were encountered included 6,386 people from Afghanistan, 3,153 from Egypt, 659 Iranians, 538 Syrians. Now, the U.S. Department of the Treasury said following this terrorist attack on Israel, the Treasury is going to sanction all the Hamas operatives and the financial facilitators who are the people that are financing it, right? Washington. Today, the U.S. Department of the Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets Control imposed sanctions on 10 key Hamas terrorist group members, operatives, and the financial facilitators in Gaza. And who are they? From Sudan, Turkey, Algeria, and Qatar. This action targets members managing assets in a secret Hamas investment portfolio, a Qatar-based financial facilitator said with close ties to the Iranian regime. He's a key Hamas commander and a Gaza-based virtual currency exchange and its operators. Okay, so Fox News comes out. Hamas attack fuels national security concerns at the U.S. border. No. Let's watch this video. With all eyes zeroed in on Gaza, America's open southern border becomes vulnerable to terrorists hiding among us uh, in the crowds of migrants. Griff Jenkins, live in Eagle Pass, where the Border Patrol agents there are raising a lot of red flags. Griff, what are they saying? Hello. Well, good morning, Bill, and that is because Fox News can confirm that in the first 14 days of this fiscal year, which began on October 1st, there have been at least two...
incidences of apprehended Iranian migrants who have hit the terrorist screening database, meaning they could have potential terrorism connections and pose a serious threat to the homeland. It comes as on Sunday morning around 3 a.m. right here where we are in Eagle Pass, they apprehended an Iranian man. In fact, across the entire southwest border, as you're looking at migrants that have just arrived, by the way, under the bridge behind me, the groups come all day long. And in this very location, early Sunday morning, 3 a.m. in Eagle Pass, an Iranian apprehended. Thursday evening, two Lebanese men apprehended. All of these special interest aliens that we've talked about is what's alarming the officials here. They're mixed in with all the other migrants from Venezuela, Ecuador, and the Northern Triangle, Central America. And some concerned citizens were out here this weekend, Bill, very upset about what they see as an unsecured border as they watch what's playing out in Israel. One gentleman, Cal Sims, talked to us. Here's some of what he had to say. Take a listen. We're letting so many people in this country, there's no way that they're going to catch all of them. And even the ones they do process, do they really know who they are? We don't know that. And Bill, let me just quickly rattle off the first 14 days, the number of special interest aliens. We've had more than 30 Iranians, nearly 60 Syrians, 35 from Pakistan, over 285 from Afghanistan, more than 100 from Russia. And get this, nearly 2,000 Chinese migrants have come. That's just in the past 14 days. Bill, we'll send it back to you. On and on it goes. Griff, good to have you back down there today. Griff Jenkins on the border. Okay. So here we go. Here's Hamas. Who are the financial facilitators? Here we see the president of Qatar with a boss, that of the Palestinians, and he's the head of Hamas. And he's meeting with them. And it says Qatar is a master double dealer. The hundreds of millions of dollars the Qataris have given Hamas during the past decade have been instrumental in helping the terrorist group to develop infrastructure that enabled it to carry out its murderous assault on Israel in the first place. Qatari would like the world to believe that it's acting as an honest broker with its efforts to secure the release of the Gaza captives, but the reality is that it deserves to be condemned by the West as the state that sponsors global terrorism so long as it maintains its indefensible support for Hamas. This is why the son of of Hamas says, forget Qatar. And we gave them $6 billion to give to the Iranians, knowing they wouldn't give it to the Iranians. Okay, here is Sheikh Hassan Youssef. He was one of the founders of Hamas. And do you know who that is? That's his son that's speaking here in Seattle that got saved and became a Christian. That is the son of Hamas. Now, this guy over here is the current leader of Hamas who planned the October 7th attacks that he talked about, Yahya Sinwar. That's his face. That's who he is. So here, the son of Hamas, he is the son, the founding leader of Hamas. And we saw the video of him talking. The problem is this. I have Hamas controlling America, South America, all of Europe, and they let's say they throw Israel out into the sea. That is not going to be good enough for them because they don't want Israel to exist. If it was political, it'd be about land. It is not political. It's religious. And so they have to destroy Israel. I don't know why our government can be so stupid. It's not about land. It's not about politics. It's about fanatical religious Islam. And it is to the death. You can't bargain with someone who goes and chops babies' heads off. Now, what's wrong with our universities today? Guess what? Qatar donated more than 103 million to the University of Virginia. 2 billion to Cornell, 700 million to Texas A&M, 740 million to Carnegie, 760 million to Georgetown, 602 million to Northwestern University. They get these big donations and then what happens? They're going to teach what Qataris want them to teach. Right here in this state, the University of Washington and Georgetown students spark outrage with the events honoring the martyrs of Palestine who slaughtered 1,300 in Israel, leaving a distraught Jewish student 
sobbing. And it says, students at schools across the country from one another cause simultaneous stirs as they rally in support of the terror attacks. The Iranian-backed Hamas terror group attacks plunge the region into a bloody war that continues to escalate. Pro-Palestinian rallies at elite universities across the country have sparked intense backlash from alumni, business leaders, and students alike. Well, what happens? California is even offering extra credit if they march against Israel. This is what Qatar has done. The possibility of anti-Semitic violence at where? Cornell. They received $700 million. Why do you think they have this anti-Semitic violence there? Said one of the posts. In addition to threatening the lives of Cornell's 3,500 Jewish students, which is a quarter of the student population, they call for an attack on the kosher cafeteria. Polling shows that a majority of those aged 18 to 24 believe that Hamas's massacre of 1,200 Israeli civilians was justified. Half of the population, it was over 50%. Hundreds of Philadelphia high school students walked out of class in March to support the Palestinians. Bloomfield High School students wanted to participate in a nationwide walkout for Palestine on October 25th. This is nationwide, all these high schools. They're getting this education in the public school system. But talk about how smart our kids are. Oregon just dropped all graduation standards and saying that failing of all of its students isn't right. So in the name of equity, everybody fails almost. But they all get a, a certificate. Yeah, in public education's latest blunder, the Oregon Department of Education just decided that basic, basic reading, writing, and math skills are not required for students to graduate with a high school diploma. Stupid is as stupid does. European U.S. cities boost security after celebrations of attack on Israel. All over the U.S. cities are celebrating. Will October 7th come to America? Look at this. It says at the bottom, think of it. Is it all that far of a psychological journey from participating in celebrations of terrorist butchery to carry out terrorist butchery? If you're celebrating it, you're not far from doing it. But as always, it's always about the money, especially at the universities. Here, they want the money, and then they end up using it to educate. Normally, if you see a missing child poster or someone who's kidnapped, you feel for the parents, you want to help. Like, here's some kid, a little four-year-old who was kidnapped. 30 Hamas kidnapped over 30 children, right? Well. Here's a little girl about four years old. Well, guess what? Across the United States, these posters that I had out here the other day for you to collect, people are putting them all over their city on telephone poles, letting everyone know they were kidnapped. That's something you guys can do. Well, guess what? All the United States, they're tearing them down. They're tearing them. Why would you tear a kidnapped poster off? There's something deeper. In Luke, let me see, I got about four minutes. Oh, good. I think I can do it. In Luke 21, verse 10 and 11, the Lord says nation is going to rise against nation, which really means ethnic group is going to rise against ethnic group. Okay, kingdom against kingdom, great earthquakes, famines, pestilences, fearful sights, and great signs will there be from heaven. What does that mean? There will be great signs in the heaven. Wow, what a concept. A matter of fact, it goes on to say in verse 25, there will be signs in the sun, in the moons, and in the stars. And upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Well, get a load of this. One thing that I thought was fascinating in Luke 24, 37, 39, it talks about when Yeshua rose from the dead and appeared to them, they were all terrified and afraid and thought they'd seen a ghost. And he said unto them, why are you troubled? Why do your thoughts raise in your hearts? Behold my hands and behold my feet. That is I myself handle me and see a ghost or a spirit doesn't have flesh and what? Bones as you see me have. I don't know if they can see his bones except through an x-ray. But guess what? In John 20, 27, he says what? Behold my hands. Well, I think it's quite fascinating that NASA's X-ray telescope unveiled the ghostly bones of a cosmic hand that's coming. And I think it's amazing that it's one that's been pierced at the wrist. <laughs> I just think that's fascinating. 
uh, that that has been uh, revealed. Well, guess what? There is also a city-sized comet heading towards Earth will become a hundred times brighter and it grows horns. Do you see the horns? Okay, well, guess what? Here it is in a smaller, further away picture. But guess what? It orbits the sun every 71 years. It will next get closest to the sun on April 21st, 2024. And it's located in the constellation Draco the Dragon. And April 21st is Passover. So here we have in the constellation Draco the Dragon in the northern sky, a comet with horns headed our way. I can't help but think of the verse in Revelation, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea for the devil's coming down to you, having great wrath because he knows he has but a short time. And when the dragon saw he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. So Exodus 17, 16, God said he's going to have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Next week, I am going to show you the signs in the heavens that are coming that we know this will be happening at this time time. Wow. One minute to spare. Let's stand.